I've been promising to do a video all about the brake booster on this build for a little while now. Today is finally the day where I'm going to tackle the job. Now, I've been putting it off because it's actually turned out to be a bit more complicated than I anticipated and there was quite a bit more research that had to go in it and collecting of parts that had to go in it than I expected. But today is the day and hopefully by the end of this video this booster is going to be in place and I'm going to have shared all the knowledge I've gained about this swap. So let me tell you a bit more about this. This is actually an E90 brake booster and master cylinder from a, a newer 3 Series BMW. And you can see it next to the E30's original brake booster here. The reason I'm needing to change the booster at all is because I'm doing the M52 24 valve engine swap. With that engine swap, the manifold will actually clash with the E30's booster because of its sheer diameter. So I needed to find a slimmer brake booster to do the job and as you can see it's obviously much slimmer but the E31 is roughly 27 centimeters this one's roughly 22 so five centimeters or so different and hopefully that means this will not interfere with the intake manifold on an M50 or M52 swap. With doing an M50 or an M52 swap, there are a few different solutions for the brake booster situation. The first and most obvious one is to relocate the original brake booster just a little bit to the right, I think by around two inches. That involves cutting a bit on the bulkhead. Uh, and it's not just as simple as that either, because you would also need to modify the clevis that's the thing on the other side, because it will be offset when poking in, into the cabin. Having seen a few descriptions of how that went, it looks like it does work, but you end up in a situation where it's, it's really quite bodgy and there's nasty holes in the firewall. So I decided that probably wasn't the right way to go for me. Historically, the most popular solution in the UK is actually to use a very specific booster from a Renault Clio Mark II 1.2 litre 2001 to 2005. But these are now becoming much harder to find in good condition. And there's a particularly fiddly aspect with the length of the push rod and people report a lot of inconsistencies in these boosters and a lot of back and forth and including modification to the push rod to get the length right which sounded like a real pain. Another option I considered is the 944 booster which is a more popular mod in the US where Clio's don't exist but these parts are very old now and again hard to get in good condition. To cut a long story short each option you pick is going to come with its own complications regarding the brake booster. But after quite a bit of research, I did settle on the E90 booster as the optimal solution in this day and age. Now, that doesn't mean this is going to be easy, and there are still quite a few things to be aware of. And I found a lot of the information is quite fragmented around the internet. So I'm hoping to bring it all together into this one video and show you exactly how to get an E90 booster working in your E30. To give a bit of context to this E30 build, it's actually a 1990 coupe. It's a 316i in absolute poverty spec. And as you can see, the M40 engine is removed and I'm planning to fit an M52 engine in here. It's right-hand drive, obviously, because I'm in the UK, uh, and there's no ABS, which those two things are key points for this conversion. There's maybe slight points of difference for your build. I will explain what the points of difference are a bit later on in the video when I get to those parts, but whether you've got a left-hand drive or a right-hand drive E30, hopefully this video will have the information that will really help you out. One of the conveniences of not having the engine in, in the bay at the moment is that I've got really good visibility and access. I've even still got the glove box out, out of its location so we can even see well from the inside. But that does mean I'm not really going to be able to comment on the performance of this brake booster. On paper, it should mean the car's braking is a bit keener and a bit more assisted. Uh, and I guess it's down to personal preference whether that's a good or a bad thing for you. As I'm more used to driving modern cars, I think it'll improve the feel for me. Now, we've already compared the diameters of the two boosters, but there are quite a few other points of difference between them as well, which we'll just have a quick look at now. For starters, the, the ports are in slightly different places. This one is a bit deeper, but not too much. The E31 has four mounting studs, whereas the E91 has only two. But conveniently, they're actually the same spacing, so we can take the nuts off this one 
and it should mount in the original holes just fine but there'll be two holes that do absolutely nothing but that's not a problem the clevis on the end of both of these is quite different that's something else we'll have to look at and turning them back around on the e90 booster you can see there's two vacuum ports on the e31 there's only one which has to, has the line which goes to the m40 manifold despite what i said earlier about the diameter of this e90 booster working just fine with the m50's manifold there is still a problem with the reservoir the reservoir will still interfere with the intake elbow so you can't use the e90's original brake fluid reservoir which is what's on it here but there's quite an elegant solution for that which is what we have here so what I have here is the brake fluid reservoir from a BMW 1602 or a BMW 2002 and as you can see it's a much more slim line reservoir bottle versus the E90's original the spacing on the tubes on the bottom actually fit with the E90 master cylinder perfect but you do need to swap out the rubber grommets to these specific ones because the pipes are different sized. I will of course link to all these parts down in the description uh, and another thing to note is there's actually two versions of this bottle. This one which has no additional ports on the side of it uh, and that's because my car is a right hand drive car so I don't need an additional port for clutch fluid. The clutch fluid has its own reservoir on the other side of the bay. More commonly though are bottles that have this extra port and that's what you'll want if your car's a left hand drive car. Another handy point is that you can apparently, and I'll just confirm this right now, swap on the E30's original cap straight onto this bottle and it should thread in just fine so you can keep your electrical connection as well which seems to be the case might want to swap the filter out from the E30 one as well though so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to shift this E30 booster off the off the bench and we can focus on the E91 and I'll see just how I can go about removing this reservoir from the top of it and getting the new one fitted on So now that's off, we can see how this is going to work with the, the bung and the tubes on this. I think that's going to work nicely. Let's take these old grommets out and stick the new ones in. Well that went really well and the 2002 brake fluid reservoir fits on a tree, almost looks like it was made for it which is excellent. So the next thing to do, now I've confirmed that, which was one of my main concerns, is to turn my attention to the clevis. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and use the E30's clevis but on the E90 booster. So I've just grabbed the clevis pin from inside the car and its retaining clip. So the pin goes through here and the clip goes on to keep it in place. On right hand drive cars, because the, the brake booster is on the passenger side, there's actually a linkage which connects between the driver's side footwell pedal inputs, transfers it to the passenger side footwell and into this booster. So it's a little bit different between right hand drive and left hand drive cars. On right hand drive cars, the clevis is actually this way up. 
to work with the linkage in the footwell. Whereas on left-hand drive cars, there's literally an L-shaped bracket on the side of the pedal, which goes through here and attaches with this pin. So there are, there are some differences. The Clevis pin is M10 size. So it's a 10 mil hole basically. And unfortunately, because the fork is wider on the E90 booster, it's just not long enough to come through the other hole, which is the first problem. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to measure from the mounting face to the center of the clevis pin hole, just to see if the distance is different. According to online sources, the distances will be different, but they look very similar to me, so I'm just going to confirm what they are now. I'm going to use this M10 size screw just because it's going to extend to one point so I can get my measure against the steel ruler. 125mm on the E31. Hmm, 125mm on the E91. So they're exactly the same distance between the hole and the mounting face, which I wasn't actually expecting. Thinking about it, as the distance between the mounting face and the clevis pin hole is exactly the same on both boosters, I can't see why I'd want to use the E30's clevis as opposed to the E91, other than the fact this one's a bit wider. I mean, the hole's even the same N10 sized hole. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take the E90 booster and bolt it into the car so I can actually see where this fork lands inside the cab. And then hopefully that will reveal what I actually need to do to make this work. But I might be finding out that for right hand drive cars this is quite a bit more simple. Well, that's a problem I didn't know I had actually. It turns out that because there's a larger flat mounting face on this E90 booster, it interferes with this sound ending which I put back. So I'm gonna to need to trim around this square hole and make it a larger circle. Otherwise, I can't bolt this in flat, so it won't work. Right, so there's the problem. So I actually need 130 mil hole in that sound deadening so I can flush mount this. I'll have to cut that now. So that's the E90 booster bolted in place now and I've tightened up the nuts on the studs so it really is firmly in its position and as you can see this is the brake pedal linkage that links all the way through into the driver's side footwell so that when you press the pedal it transfers the motion to over here is in line with this fork really nicely I can even fit the clevis pin in. The only problem is that the fork's too wide for me to put the retaining clip on the clevis pin. Other than that, it's a perfect fit. So I either need to find an alternative clevis pin which is a bit longer, or potentially an M10 nut and bolt which I can use in place of it. It's actually a huge surprise to me to find that I'm not going to have to weld this E30 clevis onto the E90's rod. Everything I've read online said you definitely have to, so I'm, 
I was fully expecting to and I'm really glad that I'm not going to have to in this case. I suspect for left hand drive cars it's essential because the clevis meets the brake pedal directly and there's no room for the extra width of the E90's fork. But on the right hand drive linkage there is plenty of room for it. I just need to get an appropriately sized clevis pin and maybe some spacers to keep it central in the fork here and then I think we'll be away. It's very likely the measurement I told you earlier for the E30's clevis from the mountain face is specific to right hand drive too and that's why I've been looking at matching the E90's length exactly where everything online says it won't. So make sure you measure yours carefully but so far the swap seems like it's going to be way easier for right hand drive cars which is a pleasant surprise. The next thing to think about is the fact there's two vacuum ports on the E90's booster and only one on the E30's booster. To be totally honest, I'm not 100% sure how the boosters work, other than there's a diaphragm inside which increases the brake pressure using vacuum, and that's what this line is on the E30, it's to get vacuum from the intake manifold. The extra hole on the E90 booster is actually for a brake servo pressure sensor. I suspect the hole being open will stop the booster from doing its job, so I'm planning to use this 13mm rubber bung to seal it off. I got this on eBay actually, I'll include a link to it in the description, it's absolutely perfect for the job, fits perfectly. Obviously if you've got an E90 booster with the sensor still attached, you can just leave it in place and it will serve as a bung. I'm not actually sure which one of these to bung off, but I suspect they do exactly the same thing. I'm going to use this one for my vacuum and hopefully swap this from the E30 onto it. The line length is irrelevant because uh, I'm using an M52 manifold so I suspect I'll throw these lines away and I'll have to arrange for a new line when I know how long it needs to be. But this one will be closer to the manifold technically, so I will leave this one open and bung this one. That went surprisingly well. And with that done, we can now talk about the hard lines. And I'll start by saying this is also of particular interest for people who live in left-hand drive areas. This E90 booster is from a UK spec right-hand drive E90. So the master cylinder ports are on the right-hand side of the booster as you're facing the car. An E90 booster from a left-hand drive car actually has the ports on this side, on the left side. And for this application, fitting it into an E30, it makes life a bit harder as the standard lines won't reach around without being extended, which is made even worse by the fact you'll need line adapters, which I'll explain in just a second. So a top tip if you're in a left-hand drive area is to import an E90 booster from the UK so the master cylinder ports are on the right-hand side. Now, these two little brass adapters actually took some finding. For some strange reason, BMW decided to use M12 thread on the ports on this master cylinder, which means the M10 fittings that you've got on your E30 brake lines will not simply screw into those, which is a real pain. So what this adapter is, it's effectively a reducer, so I can screw the M10 into there and the M12 into there, and then I can use the E30's lines, which is particularly handy. The particularly observant among you will have also noticed that the master cylinder on the E30's booster actually has three ports for brake lines, two here at the rear and one at the front of the nose of this master cylinder. Now these two are for the front and this one is for the rear. I'm not sure if all E30 master cylinders have three like this or if it's just for non-ABS equipped cars like mine. There's only one for the rear because downstream of this, in fact somewhere above mounted above the fuel tank, there's actually a T-piece which splits the rear brake line feed between the two calipers on either side of the car. Now, modern ABS equipped cars, which will be all E90s, have one front and one rear feed that goes to an ABS unit, which then distributes brake pressure between all four corners accordingly. As my E30 is non-ABS, I will need to add in a T-piece for the front, which is this that I've picked up. I'll of course link to this in the description as well, as with everything else I'm going to show in this video. But you do want to be mindful that you don't get one that works with compression fittings, you get one that works with M10 
bubble flare like the 30 lines are. Perfect fit. It's quite simple, it's the two front E30 lines will join to the T-piece and then I need to make a short line which connects it up to the master cylinder. But I'm going to hold off before I start messing about with lines because I need to get this booster in place, mock the original lines back into place and work out in what way things need bending and rooting. Looking at the new booster being a bit wider on the mounting face, it seems like both the brake line and the clutch line that run across the engine bay are going to be interfered with in the routing. So I'm going to start with the clutch line just because I know it wants to be in there and I don't want the brake lines interfering with it. So I've decided even though it's not technically part of the brake system, I want to put this in now. to a good start and that's the clutch hard line in. I had to tighten up this bend a little bit to make sure it doesn't rub against the, the new booster but it's rooted in the correct place and fastened in on this side as well so that's good. The next one to do is the one that feeds the front driver's side. I'm going to pop the line through the, the grommet and attach it to the, the braided brake hose that's in there because that's, that's immovable that and then I can work out how to feed it into these clips again and all the bending will want to be done at this end and I'll figure that out as I get to it. So let's tighten that up first. So that's both the front brake lines in now and these two ends I need to actually attach to the T-piece which then attaches to this innermost adapter. So I'll figure that out in a minute but the first thing I want to do is get the rear brake line in so I can work around it. This is the rear hard line and it goes between this strange valve thing, not really sure what that is, I'm thinking it might be a proportioning valve to lessen the power going to the rear calipers but if, if you know please do let me know in the comments because I've wondered for a while. It needs to go between that and into the frontmost port on the master cylinder. So if I just slide it into its original position you can see that because the master cylinder is much longer on the E30's booster it's quite a bit further out so what I need to do is almost make a bit of a loop to loop it back round and into this port. I think I'm going to use the line bender for this just to try and make a neat job of it. All right. 
it and if I put a big dirty curve upwards to this port, I think we'll be in business. that. So now my rear line is firmed in permanently. Hopefully I don't have to mess with that again. I'm now looking at the front lines. So I need to get this T-piece hopefully mounted somewhere sensible so I can create a line that goes between the master cylinder and this port and these two can be bent to go into these two ports. I'm thinking about putting a rivnut through here and utilizing that hole to mount it and I've just mocked up the power steering reservoir and also the fuel filter just to confirm that that won't cause interference. It's looking pretty good to be honest, so I think I might go ahead and do that. I'm going for an M5 Rivnut which fits in the hole just nicely and I'm quite excited to use my uh, Rivnut tool again because I haven't used it since the removable front core support mod. So let's get straight on with it. So I've tightened everything up now and I'm really pleased with how this T-piece is looking. Everything's tightened in just nice, including in the wheel wells. So there's one last piece, crucial piece of the puzzle here to make this all work. And that's that I need to make a small line between this port and the T-piece, which feeds brake fluid to the front calipers. Pretty important, really. Now, I've got minimal experience on making brake lines, but I have a few bits that I can make one with and a kit to flare. So let's go over to the bench and see what we can do to make this small brake line. So this is what I've got. What this is, is a brake line flaring tool and it's actually one that does single flares and double flares. I'm gonna do a bit of a whistle stop tour on this because technically it's actually the wrong tool for the job because it doesn't officially do bubble flares which are the type of flares that are found on BMW lines. I think they're also known as metric flares or ISO flares. But if you're creative, you can use a double flare kit to make a bubble flare fitting. We've got a little bit of leftover copper line, which we did a previous repair with, that we're gonna try and use. Not ideal, I'd much rather be using steel, but this is what I've got, so I'm gonna try with it. I've got my fittings that came with my T-piece, the spare ones. I've got my line cutter, which is nifty bit of emery cloth, a couple of small files, and a bit of good old WD-40. Now, I'm gonna try and get the first flare on here and see how it goes. This can be quite fiddly, this, and a bit of trial and error. So let's get the first one done, and once I've remembered how to do it properly, I will give you a bit more detail on how. Thank <laughs> you. 
lo and behold, it's bloody well worked. Can you believe it? So, like I said, this is not the right way to do a bubble flare. So before you get really excited in the comments to tell me off, I do know that there's a correct tool to make a bubble flare, but this is what I've got. And looking at this, I think that's gonna seal beautifully. So now I'm gonna show you in a little bit more detail how I did it, just a, a quick run over the steps for anyone that has this type of flare tool that needs a bubble flare in a pinch. First things first, you need to cut your line. I'm cutting a bit longer than I think I need here, which is always advisable. And you cut it with one of these handy little cutting tools. It's good to use that cutting tool because if you were to use, say, a hacksaw, you end up with it gnarled up a bit and it's, it's key that you have a clean end here. But before I go any further, I'm going to put my fittings on because there's nothing more frustrating than flaring both ends and realising you forgot. Right, so the next thing I'm going to do is set the flaring block up. You'll notice there's two sides to this. One side has the numbers and five's the one we're going to be using today. But this is for doing a double flare. What I'm actually going to do is use the underside of the flaring block, which is much flatter. It doesn't have the uh, the, be the countersunk beveled edge. So let's get this mounted into the vise. So now I've got the line loosely clamped into the flaring block and obviously cue the thunderstorm outside, but we'll, we'll carry on. What I'm gonna to need to do now is clean up this end using a couple of little files and some emery cloth. Currently the collet, which is this, won't even go in the hole. So we need to make sure it goes in without binding. It might seem overkill that, but if you haven't got a perfectly smooth end, it won't create a good sealing face, or even worse, it'll distort when you're trying to put your flare in. So the next thing to do is to put the collet alongside and get the height correct, the poke through height. So you want the poke through to be just about level with the, the base of this collet. Now I can tighten it in and you want it really, really tight because you definitely don't want the line slipping down as you're trying to press your bubble flare on. Now it's tightened up, I'm gonna use a little bit of WD-40 to lubricate this collet and put it in place. And with that, we can start using our flaring tool. You want to make sure this is dead straight, otherwise the line will buckle over and you'll basically be starting over. Also wise, to get it locked in the tightening position on the diagonal, this helps it stay a bit flatter and also it stops this whole thing from turning when you're trying to tighten it down. Right, moment of truth. It 
it's not quite flat pressed down because I do want some meat on this bubble flare. That should be about it. Let's see what we got. What do you reckon? Bloody perfect, I'd say. So I've cleaned this line up a little bit, ready to start bending and using. And I'm actually really satisfied with how that's come out. The bubble flares on the end aren't perfect like OE ones are, but they're very, very close to the right shape. And I'm very confident they're gonna create a real nice seal when screw once screwed into place. Bear in mind this line is copper. It's a little bit softer, so I think it'll be a bit more forgiving with the seal as well. So I guess that's a quick guide on how to use the wrong flare tool to make a bubble flare. I really should purchase the correct one. Right, so now I need to get a bend in it because I need this to curl over here and go into this. So it's like a, a lopsided S. After a little bit of fiddling around with this short line, I'm really pleased with it. It was slightly too short actually, but I did get away with it in the end and it's now firmed all up in place. As you can see, I've also mocked up the fuel filter into place and also the power steering fluid reservoir, just to confirm that nothing's interfering with those new lines. I've also swapped around the brake fluid reservoir, just so that the bracket side is towards the engine instead of to the outside, because I just think it'll be easier to read the level from the outside of the car this way around, and hopefully it'll look slightly neater. And yes, the electric connection is long enough and plugs in just fine. I'd like to say I just need to add fluid now and this install's done, but we're forgetting about the clevis pin, which was a problem earlier in the video. But I think I've saw something that's gonna work for us. Let me show you that now. So this is what I've got. It's a slightly longer clevis pin, which I've managed to pick up on eBay. I'll also link to it, of course. Let's see if it fits in. I think it's gonna work well, that, but I think I'm gonna add some spaces in just to keep it centrally aligned, just to be sure nothing strange happens. Other than that, I think it's going to be perfect. Well, that's been a lot more fiddly and involved than I was expecting when I embarked on this E90 booster job. But I'm very happy with the result and it's looking pretty good in place there. So to give a quick recap on what we've had to do for a right-hand drive E30 to swap the E90 booster in, I'll start from the top. So first of all, we've got sourcing a right-hand drive booster which has the master cylinder ports on the correct side. Then you've got swapping the reservoir to a BMW 2002 reservoir. Then there's fitting adapters for the M12 ports on the master cylinder, so it'll work with the M10 lines. And because this car is non-ABS, there is adding a T-piece in for the front brake calipers. And not forgetting the vacuum bung situation and also swapping on the E30s vacuum takeoff, which connects up to the manifold at some point, obviously. Need to figure that out down the line when the M52's in. Bending the lines and cutting the sound deadening so that the new servo would butt up flush to the mounting position. 
and there's also the clevis pin which on a right hand drive car seems like you can just use the 90s clevis but you need a longer clevis pin i'll link to everything i've used in the description so you'll be able to do this yourself if, you, if you've got the same kind of project on the go so in theory all that needs to happen now is to add brake fluid and get it all bled up but I'm not going to rush to do that because I'm getting quite close to test fitting the M52 engine and there is a chance I'm going to have to dismantle some things here and I'd rather not get brake fluid everywhere. So if you found this video helpful please make sure you give us a like and feel free to subscribe and see what comes next with the whole engine swap and everything but either way thank you very much for watching.